read our opening prayer and invocation together, and then we'll go into a quiet time of prayer. I am now in the presence of pure being, immersed in the Holy Spirit of life, love, and wisdom. I acknowledge thy presence and thy power, O blessed Spirit. In thy divine wisdom, now erase my mortal limitations, and from thy pure substance of love, bring into manifestation my world according to thy perfect law. So let's take some moments of quiet, of prayer time, to first of all recognize the presence and the power of God here with us, around us, each of us in our homes, here in the room, all people everywhere. And breathe into that awareness of presence of pure being, of life, love and wisdom. And we take a moment to feel this energy filling us and blessing us as we begin. And as we deepen our connection with God, with Spirit, manifesting here and now, we take a few moments to remember all those whom we hold in prayer. We include our friends and families and loved ones, seeing them blessed today. We include those that can't be with us today, Dorothy and Gail and Peter and Sally, Paul and others, and see them blessed and upheld today. And we extend our circle of prayers to unfold all that's been happening in this country recently through the attacks in Manchester and London and this fire in London. We take a moment to remember all those dear souls that have lost their lives, who have so suddenly and shockingly made that transition. And we see them moving toward the light that is their safety and their rest. We hold all their loved ones in prayers of comfort and strength. We give thanks for the social network that has come up to support everybody, whether it's the emergency services, the NHS and the doctors and the nurses, all those local communities that have stepped up, all so many people coming together to support all those affected. We give thanks for all of these dear ones. We give thanks for this deepening sense of community, of coming together of supporting and helping each other. I know that we are part of this network as we pray. And we give thanks for the opportunity of coming together today. 
of celebrating God's presence here among us. And for all that we share and witness together today, we are blessed and we are grateful. Amen. Today is Sunday, June the 18th, and the words for today, Father's Blessing for Father's Day. God bless all fathers and fathers-to-be. A beloved and oft-repeated prayer by individuals and in groups begins, Our Father. There is both great responsibility and reward in playing the role of a father. Encouraging confidence in young ones calls for a parent to be present in all stages of children's lives. Often it's not until after years of being present, sometimes when kids think they are smarter than adults, that fathers are appreciated for their wisdom and devotion. A prayer is a powerful way to bless fathers. God bless fathers with all they need to be wise and loving parents. And perhaps a prayer is even more immediate when a father or a father-to-be prays, God guide me in being a father that enriches the lives of my children. And from Chronicles, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from him who was before you. So shall we say the affirmation? We've got it in the programme, practically right. <laughs> it's good. God blesses all fathers and fathers-to-be. Let's say it together. God bless all fathers and fathers-to-be. And let's say God bless all fathers and fathers-to-be for our own fathers and grandfathers and godparents and those that we know are fathers. God bless all fathers and fathers-to-be. Now let's just take a quiet moment to think of our own fathers and those that we know that play the role of fathers today. As the Daily Word says, such an important role to encourage and support the children, to help them know who they are. Don't ask much. Just three things I want from you. Complete security, total acceptance and perfect romance. I love that, don't you? That's a, I love that saying. Um, more usual is what I really want is happiness and peace of mind. You know, I, but with a little bit of excitement as too thrown in. The Greek, the old Greeks had a word for it. They called it eudaimonia. But uh, it's uh, it's hammered home on. I don't know about you, but I see these adverts on television, and peace of mind seems to go with everything. You know, a, a, a certain kind of driving life. Uh, Dior handbags are one of the things that give you total peace of mind, apparently, <laughs> and spare lips, obviously, but also a brand of car tyre. And, uh, um, yes, apparently one of the things that has been causing unhappiness, you might not have been aware of, is that your gas meter doesn't talk to your computer, but, you know, get a new app, and that will give you peace of mind. So it's all, it's all part of the thing. Uh, as you get older, you find... I was talking to a chap yesterday who goes around the country a lot and talks to people, and he said, how come you're happy? Most of the old chaps I see are not happy. And we were talking about it, and one of the things that's come up in recent years is uh, this business of finding a meaning to life. Um, I don't know if you read Viktor Frankl's book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He had... Uh, the joy of three separate concentration camps in the war. Um, but he wrote this thing about meaning. Happy. And um, so uh, there, are, there are different things about, and we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, as soon as your basic survival requirements are met, then you need the comfort things and money and so on, and after that you need to be accepted by other people, and as soon as you're accepted by other people, then you need a Maserati so that you're better and different, and only then 
he finishes off with this thing which he calls self-actualization. And this is the, the, the Bible of advertising. And, and a, a great philo a psychologist and, uh, and thinker of his time. And I've never understood what self-actualization is. The examples they give are, you do a sculpture, you know, you paint the Mona Lisa, and that's your fulfillment. But I've all thought of it, the only people who've got the answer to this are the philosophers of religion who say, we have the answer to it, we can give you that feeling of total security, complete love and acceptance, and yet the romance, the excitement, the new feeling of fulfilment. The only problem is you're a sinner and you'll have to wait till after you're dead. And that's the standard answer. But of course, in the late 1800s, for those who don't know, uh, the movement in the United States, where, which was free from... Uh, church dogma and uh, religious legalism to some extent um, was more free thinking and said and, and also the first translations of the eastern religions had become, uh, had become available and, uh, and they said look all the things you're trying to find happiness from are ephemeral they're not real reality is something other than that and you're living the dream, not the way you think, but you're living in a fictitious, make-believe world. We tend not to put it as bluntly as that in unity. We say there's a greater reality. We don't knock the present one because it will knock you back. And, uh, but nevertheless, that philosophy became the metaphysical movement and then the transcendental movement, which said... There is this greater reality of love and peace and beauty. And by the way, you're part of it now. And it is possible, not necessarily easy, but it is simple to let go of illusion and to perceive that reality. And the Eastern religions have been talking about that for two or three or four thousand years. Uh, and the famous words of Buddha when they said to him, are you God? And he smiled and they said, well, is there a God? So he smiled again and they said, well, what are you? And he said, I'm awake. I'm awake. This wasn't the reality. It's something else. So, so that religious movement came along and said, let's look again at what is real, what is true, and like all other religions, then tell you what you have to do about it. How are you going to lead your life to experience this joy and freedom and love that, that you've been wittering on about? And, um, and Charles Fillmore, who's the sort of daddy figure of, of Unity, uh, wrote a lot of books about it. But they're very dated because we, we have to remember that he was talking not to the 20th century, he was talking initially in the 1880s, 1890s to Midwestern farmers, all of whom had grown up in, most of whom had grown up in a Protestant, Christian, Bible bashing or Bible reading environment. And so they had been taught, as most of us were, not, hey, what's the real truth behind this but this is a story and get on with it and we said oh right yeah fine right, that's the story we didn't question it so he had to work out ways of putting that into a context and of course the other thing that was happening uh, which uh, unity doesn't tend to preach a lot is that he was there right at the beginning of of um, psychology. He and Freud were only two years apart. I think Freud was born two years after Charles. And so by the time he grew up, it was the hot potato. Everyone knew about philosophy and sucked their teeth. And certainly during the earlier parts of the 20th century, it began to be accepted that many of the things we think and do and our behaviour is governed not by some front of the brain intellectual process which some people thought it was but by deep 
unconscious motivations, many of which are totally hidden to, from us. Um, uh, that, that, that song that was sung earlier is about that. It says, it says, I don't know what's wrong, what I need to know. Please, you teach me. You know, reveal that which needs to be revealed so then it can be healed because I don't know. So we go along and we say, um, you know, that, all, all right, there's this perfection idea, but I don't see it in myself, and I don't know what I have to clear out or modify. What was I going to say? Uh, you know, that wisecrack of Paul's, be transformed by the letter to the Ephesians, as it be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Fine. But I don't know what's in my mind. I have no idea. Um, I, I normally start with a, a little introduction. I, I, I meant to tell you, this, this talk is a long introduction, a short middle bit about imagination, and then a, a bit of a longer thing about how, how one might use it. Um, but I normally start off by saying, the reason I am doing this talk is because I need to listen to it. I am not sitting here as some kind of holy moly saying, I've got it licked and you better pay attention. Because I, 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 I don't know. And, and like the rest of us, I need to have my mind renewed. And Eric Butterworth says, I don't mean to shock or be flippant or too difficult, but if I stand, sit here and just read from the books, we might as well all go and sit in the reading room at, at, at Unity House. So what I need to do, or someone needs to do to me, is to provoke, challenge, give me a bit of a shake to change the way I think. And, uh, and so that's the way I've been taught when we, uh, you know, in these talks, that it's okay to say things which are provocative and then to say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that wasn't quite what I really meant to say. Uh, new information has come to me by you shaking your head, uh, and I now see it differently. So that's my little introduction. I have the right to be wrong. Uh, but I'll share with you later some exercises which have helped me in this area of imagination. Now, amongst the, uh, amongst the books that Charles Fillmore wrote was this one called The Twelve Powers of Man, where... I sort of see him saying, well, they've got the twelve apostles they all know about. None of them can name them. I can't name them. And they're only there because they're meant to show Jesus as the leader of Israel and the twelve tribes. And you can't name the twelve tribes of Israel. And I can't name them. And ten of them were wiped out 700 years before Jesus anyway. But it was part of the biblical story. Everyone knew about it. And so Charles is saying, let's take psychology, let's take this idea of looking at our behaviour and our thought patterns in an analytic way, and let's relate it to the Bible stories so that we can, as it were, click them together. And so we have the idea of love and faith and strength and so on as innate faculties and in the Twelve powers of man, a little bit Kabbalistic, he relates them to parts of the body and one of the disciples and so on. And there's a book called Twelve Powers in You, which is a sort of rewrite of that in the 1990s, uh, which is a bit more e easy to read and up to date. But, you know, they're just convenient ways of looking at aspects of myself and saying, how can they be used? How can I use them? to try to see this truth that they're talking about and have my life transformed so that joy is not coming if St. Peter lets me in the gate but it coming now in some way or another and one of those faculties is imagination and what they say in that book 12 Powers It New is uh, quite rightly imagination that's what the word means image initiation it is creating an image in our minds now not all people i think it's important to say not all people work like that for some people guided imagery meditations for example don't work at all M but many people do and certainly we are all influenced by images that we see outside 
that's why advertising works. Uh, but, but you know, you see someone sucking a lemon and you go <laughs> like that, you know, or, or, or you, one of the things that's really well researched and we know nothing about it, according to the last time I read anything, is yawning. The only thing we know is that if I yawn, you will yawn. <laughs> it is catching. And we have not a, all the theories about why it's biologically, why it has evolved as a biological function, or don't work. Hey, is that everything okay over there? Great, okay. So far, so good. <laughs> um, so, images certainly have a huge impact, and, and it appears to be that um, ladies in bikinis are essential to the selling of Pirelli tyres, for example. <laughs> Ever since I was a boy, you want to buy new tyres for your car, it's important that there's an image of a young lady there doing something like that. And, and, <laughs> uh, and um, so, so there's, there's no, no, absolutely no doubt. But creating an image in our minds is a different matter. Now the problem is that it's all too easy to become habituated to the images. Uh, uh, and Kemmerer's been talking about the, the unpleasant and harrowing images that we've seen sometimes, which are awful. I've got a friend who's going to a funeral in Manchester this week, someone uh, who goes to a guy. And, and the thing in, in Borough Market, I didn't know, started in a cafe where my son Edward had coffee only a couple of days. He has it several times there when he goes to see the people at, at, at one of the things. Uh, so uh, he knew it well. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a minuscule part of the, you know, the 80,000 deaths that there will have been this week in the country. And, uh, uh, and the... Uh, uh, and it's, it's very much smaller than road accidents and so on. I'm not trying to minimise it because it does shock us. What I'm trying to say is that newspapers and television use images that provoke fear and anger very frequently because it's, a very, it's the best way of getting someone's attention. We are programmed by our evolution, to stop, stop everything if there is danger. And those images, therefore, are important, but they are also not very conducive to the kind of awakening about which we're talking. Um, there is... Uh, I mean, some of them actually become quite addictive, and, and, and uh, you know, this accounts for the you know, the fascination of thrillers and horror stories and all, and, and, and all the other stuff. So it, it is not a natural and easy thing to train the mind to image the positive and creative and loving essence that is the reality from which we're all made. Uh, nevertheless, it can be done. And there is what's called the law of mind action. The more we use our minds to fo focus on the positive, the more pos the power of positive thinking. For goodness sake, Norman Vincent Peale, one of our old pupils, wrote a bestseller which said, the more you think about good things, the more good things happen in your life. And it's as simple as that. Um, now... I tend to go a little bit further than many Unity students. I say, and you've got to move your feet, like our friends the Quakers say. You want to be loved, do lovable things. You want to be admired, do admirable things. You know, it might be possible to sit in a chair and make this all work, but my experience is not quite like that. Nevertheless, there are... Um, uh, one of the books says, really, there are two kinds of, of using mental images in our imagination, training it to keep doing. One is for very specific things. Uh, so um, there's a funny story. I don't think we've really time to go into that. Rocco Erico tells about a woman who came. Here's a list of things. I want a husband. And he has to be this height, this job, this money, this, this, this looks. And he has to... And Rocco said, I'm sorry, you know, I have no idea whether that's right for you or not. I will certainly pray 
that you find fulfilment in personal relationships. But, uh, and then she comes back 18... She says, oh, well, I'll do it on my own. And she comes back 18 months later and he says, how are you? Everything all right? She said, no, I'm terrible. He said, well, did this man of your dreams not come along? She said, yeah, but I got missed out two things from the specification. <laughs> so it didn't work. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, so, but nevertheless, there are, I know people who've done this treasure mapping and imaging to get a specific car. And maybe they get the car, maybe they don't. Does that equate to happiness and peace of mind? Security, acceptance and romance? I don't know. What I... Eric Butterworth, oh no, Jim Roseberg is always writing about this. If you get his emails, he always talks about the metaphysician does this, the mystic, I'm a mystic. My job is to tune in to my higher power as best I can to feel and experience the guidance which may come to me in different ways but it will be right and I'll test it to make sure that's what it is and not my ego speaking or um, you know the fact that very often we don't know what it is we want we, it, we, it's stuff we've been told as a child that we ought to want or it is the latest fashion uh, the must-have Gucci hats or whatever he makes. <laughs> woman I know was really upset a few weeks ago. What's the matter? My car's been stolen. Oh, I'm so sorry. And it was a very smart car too. It's not that. I had my... What's he called, the shoe man? It's just suddenly gone out of my... Jimmy Choo shoes in it. Oh, you poor dear. Oh, really? You know, never mind the car, it's my shoes. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, life has come to that. Anyway, stop, don't be saying anything. Okay, stop it, stop it. Um, anyway, it, again, advertisements, friends, uh, our upbringing can tell us what we, we ought to want, but it's what we truly want that matters. And the writers of, of those books and my experience say it is more profitable to use an open-ended form of imagery. Let go, let God. Which then gets you into the problem of, so what is it that I'm now going to image? Goodness? Prosperity? I don't know what those look like. God! Good! You know, I take, I take Emmett Fox's Golden Key. That's one of my favourite things. Six pages and it's the answer to all the th problems you could ever have. Let go. The, don't look at the problem. Look at God. And so, imagination is a tool that I think we have to be careful of. Not to let. It's not idle daydreaming. It's not becoming addicted to horror stories or other unsavoury things. But it can be used to keep reminding ourselves that there is a world beyond this one and that's what I want where I'm secure and happy and fulfilled and full of joy. So, can we take a moment now to be still? Let the chair take the weight as we say and the Arms rest loosely in the lap, feet side by side if that feels right. And together we take a deep breath. We close our eyes and we see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light which grows larger and larger until now the light fills the entire inner vision of our mind. Our bodies are completely relaxed. We put aside the thoughts, the feelings, the preoccupations of the day. And our minds are open and receptive 
to experiencing the presence of pure love. And in that light and that love, we feel a sense of gratitude. Maybe it's the presence of a loving father who says, you are my beloved child. My beloved child in whom I am so well pleased. You are loved. Whatever happens or whatever comes about in your life. You are safe. Whatever the appearance of disorder or conflict. Nothing can change the fact that you are eternal. You will always be loved. You will always grow and become the perfect being which you truly are. Listen in the still, small silence. Notice the happenings and coincidences which occur. Experience the moments of joy or awakening to new experiences and ideas. For all of these may be signals or signs on the path. And know that I am with you always, that I love you always, that you are always perfect in my sight. So we breathe in love, we breathe out peace, and deeply breathe in a sense of fulfilment and joy. And we breathe out with a smile. say thank you, thank you for all the blessings which we now know, for all the blessings which we have yet to learn about. And we breathe in and we move our fingers and toes. And we sense the movement in this room, the presence of one another. We open our eyes. All right, so let's just take a moment then to give thanks. We've given ourselves away by being here present this afternoon, giving our time, our energy, our love, this sense of growing our identity, who we are, using our imagination to wake up to who we are, to know the truth, to set ourselves free. And so we give thanks for the money substance, the time, the energy, the love, the wisdom that's been shared. And as we continue on into our day, on, onto our week, into our lives, doing all that we need to do, we know that it is God at work. And we keep our focus on God, giving thanks for God, here with us, expressing as us, always. Amen. Amen. So let's read our centre mission statement that's at the bottom there together. 
We provide a loving and welcoming environment where we nurture a spiritual way of living. Together with spirit, we create abundant and healthy lives through prayer, learning, empowerment and joy. We celebrate, bless and appreciate our oneness. Thank you. 